We're flying an actual mission in an iconic bush plane. Oh, that hit me right in the knee. Are you waiting, are you, are you waiting on me? Uh, yeah. And trying to make a film about it without getting in the way. Challenge accepted. Here, why don't you give it a try? Okay. And it didn't hurt that we were flying in one of the most beautiful areas in Canada. Vancouver Harbour hosts the busiest water aerodrome on Earth and is overseen by the world's highest control tower perched on top of a skyscraper. Seaplane operations thrive here. Hi, I'm Peter Grimm and I run Van City Seaplanes. We uh, operate a coastal 702-703 operation in beautiful BC. Peter is understated and humble and had tons of wisdom to share. He offered to take me for a casual ride in the legendary Canadian-made bush plane, the DHC-2 de Havilland Beaver. I'm literally scratching my head about where to put my stuff because all these struts are so big. So we're thinking we're going to suction it in a tether. But normally would not put a suction cup on the outside of an airplane. It's around this time that Peter let us know our flight just got real. Well, last night at about quarter to 12, I got a uh, text message from uh, a regular passenger and he said, I'm, uh, I'm needed at work, I got to get back to work ASAP. Um, what do you have for flights available in the morning? And so I looked at our flight schedule and our manifest and we're absolutely full with all our flights. So I said, well, I've got this time slot that I put aside to fly with flight chops. Why don't we turn that into a charter and uh, we'll drag flight, flight chops along for our little mission to come and get you. I could easily turn the phone off and walk away from it. And um, other people's problems could be other people's problems. But when you're in the business and this is what you do and you support a community, it's all about taking care of you know, getting people where they need to go. Doesn't really matter what time of night it is, if I get the message, then um, we're on. Now that this was an actual mission, we had to work a lot faster than originally planned. This half truck thing is awesome. Peter designed and purpose built this thing as part of his fleet. That is so freaking weird. Peter uses it to manage his airplanes that are on straight floats. Before I knew it, we were rolling, literally. This is running and gunning, man. We're an airplane that's driving when the prop's not turning. It's raining and I'm doing some quick rigging. Peter is a pro, this is how they roll. After a quick stop to refuel, Peter dropped the plane in the water. It's on straight, non-amphibious floats. Yeah, to me, this is what's hard about float flying, like trying to manage putting your plane in the water or something, in these currents. He's doing this all by himself. He doesn't need any help. Interesting stuff. That to me seems like the hardest part of float flying is having to manage your plane when you're dealing with currents and... <laughs> yeah, it's all the water work. So right now we're half in and half out and you're just going to power us out? Yep, right. that's exactly it. Morning pick ground, it's Van City 200. Van City 200, pick ground. Pick ground, Van City 200, we're on the float ramp. It'll be west side, we're headed to Alpha Mike 9. That's the 200, roger that. Uh, wind 1608, altimeter 3010. Taxi wire at your discussion. Contact tower when ready for the flight. Flock 3065. Dart, Van City 200, ready to go west. Van City 200, tower take off the water, your discussion. Van City 200, ready to go? Ready to go. Alright, go. away we go then. Takeoff, you had a bunch of flaps in there and then you got rid of them? Yeah. Yeah, we use a uh, takeoff flap and then we retract those up to uh, climb setting. As we get underway, Peter explains that our mission today is more important than just getting someone to their vacation home. There's a pretty big fire burning uh, in, in Delta at the Burns Fog area. We can see some of the remnants of it and we can smell it in the plane right now too. Yep. 
We're actually picking up the deputy fire chief for uh, Delta. He's uh, on vacation right now, but he's getting called into work because of uh, what's going on. I go pick up his uh, mother-in-law and then pick him up and bring him back to uh, put him to work. A pretty good fire still burning even after. Uh, I did run in some water bombers to come and deal with it yesterday afternoon. Wow, still quite a bit of residual smoke there. Some airplanes back in the day, this was like a different order where prop and throttle is. Yeah, right now, usually it's uh, throttle, prop, mixture. And uh, this one is prop, throttle, mixture. All right. So the prop and the throttle are, are switched in this one from what we uh, are now used to as a standard configuration. So. Yeah, that, that was the original setup? When they were yeah, that's the original setup for this one. Yeah. This one is a uh, Canadian civil aircraft, it's never a military aircraft. Each one of these airplanes has a pedigree and a history. Uh, this one, of course, being a fairly high time machine, people actually know the airplane itself, right? Like they'll say, I used to fly in this airplane sitting on my grandpa's lap, sitting in the front of this plane. And these are, these are people who are grandparents now. My friend's dad was an Air Canada captain on the uh, Airbus, and I met him one day on the beach somewhere. This airplane was his first commercial ride. This was this was the airplane that started his career, and he went and sat down in the in the pilot seat, and I gave him a few moments alone, and and he came out with a bit of a, a tear in his eye. He's like, you know, this old girl brought me home some days when I shouldn't have come home. Yeah. That kind of chokes you up a little. It's like, holy shit, yeah. I'm like, you know, list goes on for all sorts of things that we end up doing that are out of the norm. It's a fabulous machine. They're a pickup truck of the sky. They do what we ask. And in return, we take care of them. That's why we all love them so much. The Beaver is a, a fantastic platform. It um, has a good, useful load. It's uh, it's overbuilt, and they work really well. They work hard. They're small enough that we can get in and out of places where we uh, where we need to. Like what year is this one? This one's a 1956 serial number 963. Wow. We're just rebuilding a couple of airplanes right now, and we're rebuilding number 17, wow. and uh, also number uh, 1285. Yeah, we're, we're rebuilding a few airplanes for our fleet right now. We've got some for sale as well, and, and those will be the subsequent machines, but um, maintenance-wise, uh, all the parts are available, and uh, there's good support. The airplanes are fairly heavily used, the ones that are still out there, so um, we don't see that changing anytime soon. Reported winds are not gusty, but if you have a look at the water up on the river up ahead, see some big dark lines, and that tells me that it is. <laughs> right, that is gradients and changes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you can go to the same place a thousand times, it'll be different every time. You can see the gust lines and where they're going. Yeah, when, you, when you fly a beaver a little faster than your approach speed with a little bit of flaps, it just picks up the tail and it feels like a wheelbarrow. Yeah, this is amazing, nose down attitude. City 200 is on the water. Van City 200 Tower, Roger. So the first stop was the river beside Vancouver International Airport to pick up the chief's mother-in-law to relieve him at the cottage to look after the kids. It was pretty cool to watch how easy Peter made it look to dock this airplane when the water had a current and the winds were gusting. So that to me right there, that's the hardest part about flow flying, I think, is that. Drifting to a dock, shutting down, jumping out, grabbing a rope, and not screwing it up, because once you're shut down, like, he's already got us tied up, he's gone, he's walking to get his passenger. <laughs> it's very cool. I think it takes a few hours to get the rating, but that takes years to master. All right. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that's impressive, watching the smoothness of how you did that. Probably the first, I don't know, a few thousand times didn't turn out that good. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I figured, it takes a thousand times to get it right. Yeah, probably at least.
four, clear to land runway two six left. Be a beaver crossing the far end of the runway uh, northbound. Roger, Chaco, Marshalk, uh, one zero four, clear to land two six left. Pretty off standard departure that they just given us. Yeah. Right across the international. Yeah. Right across the uh, the button of zero eight right. Talking about the docking, the art of docking, taking a thousand times to get it right. How uh, how wrong is the wrongest one you've ever had go? <laughs> well, when you're learning to fly floats, there's uh, there's always a whole bunch of rules of thumb that you that you start taking on, and like never go, never approach a dock any faster than you want to hit it. Right, right. And there's always the plan ahead, plan ahead, plan ahead, and then uh, scramble to make it work. Right. <laughs> training can only take you so far, and then... Training can only take you so far. The seven-hour rating, that's just a license to learn at that point. The only guys that are really, really good out of this, straight out of the gate, are guys with ton of boat experience. Their skills and their, their time on the water are absolutely invaluable. This is a mistake right here. You're not supposed to be there. That's the one that I thought they didn't tell me about that, uh, that plane crossing, so... It's a little close. Somebody's probably going to get their uh, knuckles wrapped for that afterwards. Can see 200, what altitude do you? Uh, 500 feet works fine for us. Okay, that's proof. We're usually cleared on a 500 foot uh, departure. I kept it a little lower than that because we had that crossing traffic there, so it's like, probably best that we're not at the exact same altitude. Yeah. On a typical flight, how high do you go? 500 feet. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a, a, a 1,500 foot ceiling is like, Good to go. Oh yeah. What's a bad day at the office for you? 300 feet, two miles. Good God. I took a photo the other day because the afternoon ended up looking like this and I knew that it was going to clear up so I thought it would be kind of fun to post something on Facebook with my friends. And this is the morning photo. Yep. And I just swipe yep, it? swipe it. That's the afternoon, same, same spot. spot. That's crazy. <laughs> same spot, same view. I mean, as far as weather and planning and stuff are concerned, we tend to have a pretty good long-range forecast in our mind of, of what, what's going to be happening. We look at weather every day. Uh, we look at which days uh, the trends are going to change, what, what we're going to experience as far as changing conditions at the different islands are concerned. Oftentimes, uh, we already know what the, uh, what the trends are going to be, and uh, there's very little in the way of surprises. Beautiful, man. It's such an awesome office view you got. Yeah, this is uh, this is what I do for work. So it's pretty spectacular. I can't imagine working as a float plane pilot anywhere else in Canada. This is my home, and this is where I like to be. But it's uh, it's very very different and very diverse. Uh, we get mountain flying. We get uh, we have ocean work. We have lakes, rivers. You name it. Yeah, uh, Alpine lakes. As we approach Savory Island, Peter talked through a lot of the variables he had to think about as a float plane pilot that us land pilots just don't need to worry about. The further out to sea that you get, the more consistent the wind is going to get. Right? The closer into shore it is, the more disturbed your air is due to these different islands and, uh, and the shoreline. It's this balancing act between taking wave action and taking disturbed air. Uh, this is Savory Islands right up ahead here. They call it a displaced Hawaiian island. It's a very thin island as you see on the GPS here. Basically white sand beaches all the way around except for the point right over here which is uh, rocky. This is why they call this area the Sunshine Coast is because it can be dismal weather in town and inevitably there's better, better weather as we head further up here. All right, so you see I'll just pull it back the power a little bit. Got it back 25 inches. Adding our curve heat. The line of the beaver is, is fairly straightforward as far as uh, operations are concerned. Reduce the power to get ourselves into the flap range. Uh, we're going to want to add some flaps on, on landing to slow the plane down and, and to uh, pick up the tail a little bit. We want to target 80 miles an hour on approach. Bring it in and uh, you adjust your power for, uh, for distance. No, not much different than any other airplane. Oh, smooth. There we are. Shout out to the BC General Aviation Group for hooking me up with Peter and a pile of other adventurers while I was out there. 
Uh, if you're an aviator in the area, definitely look these guys up. I'm going to be back and I'm definitely going to be doing my float rating and I'll be following up and doing a lot more training and getting more of Peter's insights when I actually know what the heck I'm doing. We're going to be crossed over mid-island by the old airstrip, headed back to uh, Vancouver. So you can see the airstrip itself is where it's cutting the, tr cut the trees there. Here, why don't you give it a try? Okay. I got a feel for it here. Yeah. So what am I maintaining? Steve. Yeah. 600. Five, five, 600 feet. We'll just kind of ride the wave as it goes. This is flying by the seat of your pants, that's for sure. Yeah, you can just head towards that point over there, or that sort of thing, and they can sort of take a little bit of a curved approach as we go down. They, uh, they really hit the nail on the head when they built these airplanes. There's yet to be an airplane, in my mind anyways, that's a, a direct replacement for the Beaver, doing exactly what the Beaver does. Pretty nice feeling machine, though, eh? It's really smooth, lots of visibility. It takes people a little bit of a while to uh, get used to the uh, sort of wings level attitude of the plane. You're doing, you're doing pretty good. Traffic number three. Oh, you're gonna steal it back from you, Steve. That's for sure. Thanks a lot. That was awesome. Thanks a lot, man. That was awesome. You're Ridiculous. Well, that was my first ride in a Beaver, and that was awesome. Seems like a tank, but it flew super smooth, like Cessna, really. Or even better, actually. More stable. I don't know. Awesome. This guy's a seasoned pilot. Amazing to be with him. All my life, I've known what a Beaver was. My parents worked at the Havilland, and I've never had a chance to get even in one. So to have my first ride in a real working, old, beat-up Beaver that's just doing its job, it's awesome, this is an amazing experience. Thanks to Patreon supporters and sponsors for making this possible. Please visit flightchops.com to win stuff and keep your flight chops sharp. And the demands of the customers are always different too. Bringing strippers into bachelor parties, bringing friends up to boats, a bit of everything. Uh, the, the answer is always, yeah, sure. Yeah.